Good morning, bom dia. My name is Giovanni Bruna, and I am program manager at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. We're thrilled to reconvene again in person after a couple of successful editions in the past of the Global Solutions Forum that were held hybrid or entirely virtual for reasons that we are all well aware. We want to welcome you all who are joining in person today and online as we celebrate this fourth edition of the Global Solutions Forum, which brings together experts, sustainable development experts from across the SDSN network to showcase how they are implementing local initiatives that are advancing the 17 SDGs. This edition will showcase five transformative and scalable solutions focusing on health and or sustainable development challenges that intersect with health-related issues as in alignment with this priority theme um, established by the GSTIC conference. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague directly from Paris, Yves Delamothe Karoubi, head of the network's program at SDSN, where she leads our team and its efforts to build a global network of universities, research centers, civil society organizations, that pursue sustainable development innovation through research, public education, executive training, scalable projects, convening of multiple stakeholders, and incubation of solutions such as the ones that we will all learn about today. Over to you, Eve. One second, Eve, we are trying to hear you. I can hear you. Now, perfect, thank you. Okay, great. So good morning, Rio, and good afternoon from Paris. My name is Yves de Lamont Karoubi, and I am head of networks at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Thank you for joining us for the fourth edition of the Global Solutions Forum, one of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network's flagship annual events. For those of you who might not be familiar with us, the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, known as SDSN, was launched in 2012 under the auspices of the UN Secretary General. We started off with 10 thematic groups with experts from around the world working across a range of environmental, social, and economic topics who contributed to the debate and ultimately the adoption of what we know as the Sustainable Development Goals. The SDSN grew quickly and founded its Global Networks Program, a membership-based alliance of top-tier knowledge-generating institutions focused on sustainable development, organized at the national and regional level. As of this year, the SDSN has nearly 1,800 member institutions organized in 53 networks across 145 countries. We are the largest network of its kind and growing quickly. The Global Solutions Forum demonstrates the power of this network by bringing together experts from around the world to showcase how they are implementing local initiatives that are advancing the 2030 agenda. In particular, the concept of innovation and scalability lies at the heart of the Global Solutions Forum. We are seeking to inspire and connect by presenting clear opportunities for action within the framework of the latest available science. Thanks to our renewed partnership with the Global Sustainable Technology and Innovation Community, this edition of the Global Solutions Forum hosted at the sixth GSTIC conference focuses on solutions that address health or on sustainable development challenges that intersect with health-related issues. Given the global context, we all appreciate the centrality and cross-cutting nature of this important topic. Today, we will see diverse presentations by SDSN members from Canada, Italy, on behalf of our Mediterranean Regional Network, Mexico, Senegal, for our Sahel Regional Network, and South Africa. I particularly want to thank our presenters, not only for their excellent work, but also for having traveled to Rio to be there with you today as well as our moderator and our solutions committee who are connecting remotely like me. And of course, I wanna extend gratitude to our partners at GSTIC for co-hosting this event with us, as well as our other partners, 
Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet, which is an online repository where these projects will be featured and where you can also explore a number of other innovations from around the world, as well as the German Corporation for International Cooperation, GIZ, which supports our program. Thank you all for attending and for tuning in. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce the president of SDSN and university professor at Columbia University, Jeffrey Sachs, for some opening remarks. Thank you. Greetings, friends. I'm Jeffrey Sachs, university professor at Columbia University and president of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And you can see on the back, uh, I'm here with my friends. I'm in Nairobi, just at the edge of the Nairobi National Park. And uh, the zebras are here to say hello to you. But I'm thinking of Rio and the wonderful event that GSTIC, the uh, Global Sustainable Technology and Innovation Community, and SDSN, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, are hosting together in the magnificent city of Rio. And this conference, which will have participants from all over the world, is on health and well being for a sustainable future, uh, absolutely central for our global mission of achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. This is the sixth edition of the GSTIC conferences, and I must say how utterly appropriate it is that it is being held in Rio. Rio, of course, was home to the Earth Summit, uh, nothing less than the place in 1992 where the world's governments committed for the first time clearly to a pathway of the future based on sustainable development. And they committed at that time to three critical multilateral environmental agreements. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which till today guides the global efforts to uh, address the climate crisis. The second, the Convention on Biological Diversity. And third, the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. So relevant for where I am in Kenya today because the Convention to Combat Desertification is the convention to face the crisis of the dryland regions. And even as I speak, millions of people in northern Kenya, especially on the border with Ethiopia, are facing a severe drought, the kind of climate disturbance that is, of course, visiting essentially all parts of the world in different forms, droughts, floods, heat waves, extreme storms, rising sea levels, all of the reasons why we are gathered. We won't have a healthy, sustainable future unless we get to the core of the challenges that the Rio Earth Summit first faced. And Rio became the site 20 years later in 2012, when the government's realizing that despite the three multilateral environmental agreements, despite a, a legal framework, we were not turning the tide. And when the governments assembled in 2012 in Rio at the Rio Plus 20 Summit, they took a decision that I think is of inestimable importance. And that is to put the issue of sustainable development in front of all of the people of the planet by adopting sustainable development goals. Well, we know that coming out of Rio Plus 20, governments deliberated and negotiated for three years and in September 2015, adopted the 17 sustainable development goals. And we are now exactly midway in the 15 year SDG period. And we know we face massive crises. But we were going to speak about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and its continuing aftermath. We're not out of that pandemic yet, but it also taught us many lessons about how we need to respond pro-socially, how we need to have our innovation systems work for all. 
we're in the midst of war, which is the devastating, uh, destructive force right now on our planet and also the force that blocks us from the kind of global cooperation that is so essential to face the truly uh, monumental challenges to achieve the sustainable development goals. So as we meet midway in the 15 year period, uh, not all is well. We need to be even more innovative. We need to be more proactive. You're going to hear many solutions put forward, many innovative approaches to achieving the sustainable development goals. I want to conclude just by emphasizing that there are multiple pathways to SDG innovation. And I want to mention three very quickly. One is innovation in data. I'm coming now from Dubai, from the World Government Summit. I'm in Kenya today and on my way to the African Union annual meeting in Addis in just a couple of days. At the World Government Summit in Dubai, one of the core themes was mobilizing real-time data, especially digital data, uh, a heavy use of remote sensing and satellite data, so that we have powerful G geographic information system, GIS-based data, in order to address the challenges that we face, whether environmental or for social planning, such as where to place new schools, or for planning the energy transformation to a green economy. Now, Brazil has long been one of the countries in the lead of deploying uh, space-based uh, data, for example, the Brazil Space Agency monitoring uh, the state of the Amazon using uh, satellite readings. I want to appeal to our whole community that we emphasize the collection and processing of smart, real-time digital data so that we can get ahead of the crises that we face, whether it's monitoring potential disasters or policy planning for public investments in health and education, <coughs> or enforcing uh, the uh, edicts uh, against uh, deforestation or illegal fishing by being able to monitor the illegal activities and then taking enforcement measures. So innovation in data collection and management is one area that I want to quickly mention. Uh, a second innovation that I want to mention is using uh, digital technologies for community-based services. Uh, just today, uh, my wife Sonia and I were together with one of the great heroes of community health, uh, Miriam Ware, a champion of community health in uh, African villages. And we know from her work and from uh, work that we've been engaged in with many of you at this conference, community health services are a powerful way to reach people often in remote areas, often uh, living at very low income levels with highly effective uh, life-saving measures. I would emphasize that with smart digital devices now, with the possibility of remote monitoring of patients, with the possibility of telemedicine, of remote reading of x-rays and other uh, data imaging, uh, with the use of uh, direct communications on smartphones, we can greatly empower community health workers and turn community-based healthcare into a cutting edge, life-saving tool. And I think that this kind of uh, approach, Miriam Wary's community health approach, uh, strengthened by new uh, and rapidly advancing digital technologies is absolutely essential for us to achieve SDG3, health for all, and especially target 3.8, universal health.
coverage. And the third area of innovation that I'd like to just mention very briefly is also uh, near and dear to Rio's heart, and that is innovation in finance. Rio is home to BNDES, the Brazilian uh, Development Bank. Now, BNDES is the lead institution in Brazil for innovative funding of the core infrastructure that is needed for the energy transformation that is needed for uh, uh, climate adaptation and resiliency that is needed for upgrading the business environment with modern, smart transport uh, and other infrastructure, especially uh, zero carbon uh, green uh, infrastructure. And so we know from our work in SDGs together, there are so many solutions at hand that are not being deployed currently because they don't have an effective funding mechanism. When I was in Rio recently and I had the opportunity to meet with the leadership of BNDES, it was clear to me that BNDES and similar institutions around the world have a true innovation role to play by bringing new forms of finance, new forms of resource mobilization to support all of the solutions that you will be speaking about in this conference. So whether it is data management or new forms of community engagement or new forms of finance, these are examples of the wide range of innovation that is possible, indeed, that is underway and that will be needed to achieve the sustainable development goals. I'm very excited that the leadership of the G20 in these years, this is the group of the 20 largest economies of the world that have the means to take a tremendously important SDG-based decisions, especially around finance, but also about the deployment and sharing of technology, that the G20 leadership is in the hands of the major developing countries. In 2022, the G20 was led by Indonesia. In 2023, the presidency is with India. And in 2024, the presidency will be with Brazil, followed by 2025 in South Africa. So this is just to say we have the focus of the really key uh, emerging economies, the dynamic centers of thinking, and a changing global leadership uh, in the hands of the countries who know what is important for future development. So we have a wonderful opportunity, colleagues, to put forward new solutions that can be scaled and adopted worldwide. Once again, thank you so much to GSTIC for your leadership over the years on promoting new innovative solutions. Thank you to my colleagues at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network which now has more than 1,800 organizations worldwide, mainly universities, in networks all over the world dedicated to the Sustainable Development Goals. And thank you to our colleagues in Rio. You've been in the forefront of this wonderful global effort of health and well-being for all uh, for so many decades. And we count on you and know that we can count on you for your leadership in the critical, crucial years ahead. Thank you so much. I'm sure there will be many, many breakthroughs in today's conference, and I'm absolutely thrilled that uh, uh, SDSN uh, and uh, GSTIC together are coming together uh, to uh, help uh, promote these new uh, breakthroughs in ideas and in approaches for the Sustainable Development Goals. A successful conference to all of you, and I look forward to seeing many of you in person uh, in the very nearest future. All best wishes.
A huge thank you to our president of SDSN, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, for such inspiring remarks and valuable insights as we work to accelerate progress on the 2030 agenda in this most pressing decade of action. SDSN is really honored to also introduce Clara Marin, policy coordinator at IS Global and physician specialized in public health in Barcelona, Spain. Clara will moderate the following presentation of five solutions and the subsequent discussion between the solutions committee members, which are all online, and the presenters. SDSN is thrilled to count with the participation of Michael Shank, Director of Engagement at Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, Maria Elena Botazzi, who is Professor of Pediatrics and Co-Director at the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development at Baylor College of Medicine, and Suzanne Grimm, Senior Advisor of Competence Center Health and Social Protection at GIZ as today's Solution Committee members. For those tuning in online, please do feel free to submit your questions and comments uh, via the chat function, and we will relay them to the presenters at the end of their presentations. Clara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, because we do not have much time, and we want to just uh, have all the time in the world to hear our speakers and our STEAM Solutions Committee, I'm just going to kick off. And I am going to present our first speaker who is joining us online from Canada. He's John Labis. Do we have John Labis online already? Yes, good morning. Okay, right, great. So uh, John Labis is the co-lead of the Global Commission on Evidence to Address Societal Changes, uh, Challenges sorry, at McMaster University, and he is the director of the McMaster Health Forum. He is going to tell us about an evidence support system for decision makers. John, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. And I'm hoping it's okay if I share my slides. Are you able to see the shared slides? Yes. Great, so thank you very much for having me. Um, SDSN Canada, um, this represents our work, but also the work of our collaborators across a number of other SDN networks. Um, so I've got just four slides. First one is about the problem, which we framed as we're generally not responding to decision makers' questions with the right mix of forms of evidence. And you'll see on the left of this slide um, four steps that are commonly uh, undertaken in decision making, understanding a problem and its causes, selecting an option to address it, working through implementation, and then monitoring and evaluating. Jeff Sachs mentioned data analytics, absolutely critical at the front end with the problem definition, critical at the back end with monitoring, but other forms of evidence and specifically other forms of domestic evidence are absolutely critical if we're gonna understand the current lay of the land and where the opportunities are in future. We also need to be combining that domestic evidence with the best evidence from around the globe, including understanding how it varies by groups and contexts. Um, but often we're not even responding with evidence. We're responding with other things um, than best evidence. We respond with single studies that haven't been appraised for quality or placed alongside other studies addressing the same question. We hear squeaky wheel experts who don't speak in a way that make it possible to judge their accuracy. We see lots of what we call old school expert panels using an approach that we refer to as gobsat, good old boys sitting around the table. Uh, no pre-circulated evidence, no people with lived experience, no evidence methodologists around the table, and no effort to ground their recommendations in what we know from best research evidence, but also people's lived experiences. And finally, we have many citizen and stakeholder engagement processes that don't provide ways in for evidence. I have two slides about the solution. One is focused on the what, uh, strengthening domestic evidence support systems. And you'll see on this slide, the types of infrastructure that we think are key, structures and processes on the demand side to incorporate evidence into routine processes, efforts to build an evidence culture, efforts to build capacity for evidence use, but also mechanisms at the interface between the demand and supply side to identify those evidence needs and then to package evidence from multiple sources into inputs that align with advisory and decision-making processes. And then finally, evidence support units 
on the supply side that are timely and demand driven, often nowadays we're having to respond within days at most weeks with the best evidence and focused on contextualizing the stock of existing evidence, both domestic and global, for a given decision in an equity sensitive way. And we would distinguish that domestic evidence support system from the world that most of us in universities work in, a research system focused on creating generalizable knowledge where we're measured with grants and publications and an innovation system more focused on commercialization. So we think it's critically important uh, to differentiate this evidence support system. My other slide about this solution is the how. We think it's critically important uh, to be conducting rapid evidence support system assessments and then systematizing and scaling up what's working. Looking across central agencies like ministries of finance, line departments like health and climate action, parliamentary or legislative bodies, asking how they coordinate the many questions and prioritize those that most urgently need answers, do they have a win one window request mechanism for complex questions? Do they have a way of coordinating the multiple different units that can bring different forms of evidence like data analytics, like evaluations and so on? And do they have substantively focused units like those focused on SDG3 that can bring together multiple forms of evidence? And are they connected to the global evidence architecture? So when we received a request in three days to say what can public health units do in Canada in the area of climate action. In the past, we would not have been able to do very much, but we now have a living evidence synthesis with more than 17,000 studies already identified and appraised. So within three days, we could produce a very high level, uh, a very robust answer. Some of what we're finding from our peer countries, many countries have few of these features, even fewer of these features are working optimally. We hear many countries say we have several leading edge groups, but we have a, a hollowing out of policy capacity. We don't keep up with new developments in evidence use. We hear a lot of countries say we mostly rely on in-house staff and management consulting firms. We don't have a way to get these questions to best in class service oriented evidence support units. And a lot of groups saying we do well with data analytics, fairly well with evaluation, not very well with other forms of evidence. 12 countries currently doing this work, some focused nationally, China and South Africa, some at the subnational level, some with a sectoral focus and learning from one another. Teams are systematizing and scaling up these innovations, both ones on the demand side, and you'll see an example in brackets. On the supply side, there's ultra rapid evidence support within days but also things like one-stop shops, every evidence synthesis in the world about the SDGs sitting in a database called Social Systems Evidence, but also filling gaps with solutions adapted from other contexts. So if you're interested in leading a rapid evidence support system in your country, please get hold of us. We see a lot of reasons for optimism, but also a lot of reasons why we really need to double down on efforts to power SDG efforts with country level best evidence. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Brilliant presentation. We are now going to turn to our STEAM Solutions Committee for feedback. Susan, are you there? Yes, I am, and I hope you can hear me all. Go ahead, Susan. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you very much, Professor Levis, for your inspiring presentation. Um, and, uh, and I think it is uh, unquestionable that um, the need for more evidence-based policy decisions uh, is there. Um, yet existing evidence is uh, too often ignored resource for decisions which concern all of us as a global society and more than ever the future of our planet as well. So paying attention to this uh, yet missing bridge between available evidence and policy decisions and suggesting a systematic approach is really a great initiative and I think really might become a game changer. I'll take it as an inspiration for our work in International Development Corporation, um, where we uh, actually advise partner governments in low and middle income countries, uh, not only on health, but also how to use uh, evidence in their policy decisions. 
And uh, I will have two questions, uh, and the one uh, results from taking the inspiration to my world of development cooperation. Um, are you also planning to address um, beyond or in addition to national governments and, and CEOs or managers of uh, great big organizations, are you also planning to address uh, big players, um, donor governments, um, development agencies, etc., to to mainstream the message, to mainstream the approach, and to to um, that way enlarge the impact of it. And the second question, if I'm allowed, uh, is a bit more tricky, I should say. Um, I'm always interested in the last mile. And uh, in this case, um, if a domestic evidence support system is established and evidence is on the table and provided in a better way to decision makers, Often these policy makers are in the dilemma around the world because um, they have to take decisions which um, the majority of, of people, maybe even voters, um, or I should say voters, not necessarily um, appreciate. Do you factor this in, um, in, in the approach of uh, the support system? Is there a way to factor this in so that um, the evidence is also guiding policy makers towards um, the way uh, of taking decisions. Thank you very much. John, you can go ahead and answer the question. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for the, the kind comments. And we are absolutely hoping to move to some of these other organizations that you've mentioned, donor agencies and so on. Our initial focus is working with governments where COVID-19 was such a dramatic wake-up call. Um, so many things didn't go well in terms of how evidence was used to support decision making, but also so many innovations emerged. So many of our uh, peer countries feel that now is the time for a concerted push with governments, but the types of organizations that you mentioned, uh, Suzanne, we agree are absolutely critical. It's just, uh, it's a big, uh, bite uh, to bite off to do what we're doing already, but we do hope to move to some of those other ones. And then my my background is political science, and many of our collaborators in the other countries are as well. And so we're very much aware that people are uh, democratically elected in many countries to make very tough choices on our behalf. Evidence is one input into many, but we do have mechanisms like deliberative dialogues that put the evidence alongside all of those other political considerations. And we have citizen panels that allow citizens themselves to engage in these very tough conversations with the trade-offs that are inevitably involved in making these very tough decisions about societal challenges. So we're not aspiring to a technocracy, we're aspiring to a robustly evidence underpinned set of societal and government level conversations about how we do better. So the politics is front and center for us. We're just trying to be much more efficient in how evidence is surfaced within those kinds of political deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you. Maria Elena, Michael. Yes, I can go next. Uh, John, uh, congratulations. It's uh, really amazing all the work that uh, you all are doing. And uh, um, my only comment is always, you know, that yin and yang of eventual hopeful harmonization, but taking into the account that we all in the world are also very different, you know, culturally and socially, right? And so it's how uh, the envision eventually also sustainability, especially due to the nature of the political instabilities and shifts that, you know, tend to, um, move one foot forward and then move two backwards because of course of the changes in um, in the political will or the political um, contributions or supports but you know i congratulate uh, for this great uh, great attempt and idea and, and wish you good luck michael 
Sorry. John, yeah. if you're yeah. weighing in, you're muted, Sorry. and then Sorry I'll follow you. Yeah, do you want to add, Sorry. and then I'll go? I, I do, very briefly. Just to say, um, we're trying to harmonize the approach to the rapid evidence support system assessments, but each one is about uncovering what, in a given political context, is working well that needs to be systematized and scaled up and where the gaps are, and then encouraging people to look at other countries but adapt them to their context. Because as you said, Maria Elena, these are just such different in environments and what works well in one environment may or may not be transferable, but we think there's lots of lessons learned. And then the sustainability issue is a very big one. Um, and so we're always looking for windows of opportunity. Given you're in Rio, I'll just point out that our Latin American colleagues are saying Brazil, Chile, Colombia, three countries undergoing big political shifts now is an obvious time to move while there's the political interest, try and institutionalize new approaches, and then hope that during periods where times aren't as pro-evidence, that some of those institutions can survive the more difficult times. But point's very well taken. Hey, everyone. I'll just weigh in quickly here. I am not the health expert that Suzanne or Maria Elena are. But I am not in Rio right now, but wish I was. Rio is one of our members at the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. So greetings to everyone. We are big fans of what Rio is doing as a city on the sustainability front. What I think about in this space is behavior change and how we get people to do things differently. How do we change systems? How do we change behaviors? And John, some of the stuff you talked about, you talked about people's lived experience. You talked about how evidence is surfaced. When I hear that, I think of stories and I think of all of us using our Hold on, let me see if I can hold up my, yep, my smartphone there to tell those stories, to surface that evidence. And a phrase that I love a lot that I want us to think about throughout our time together today is the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And so how do we tell stories of how life is better doing the things that all of us are recommending in the solution space today? And so encouraging all of us to get outside our comfort zone and tell some of those stories. Because that is, that is the data, that is the evidence that John is talking about, and how do we surface those in visible ways, in visual ways, using video and image to really convince people and bring people on board this solutions movement. So that's me from, for now, and John, keen to offline with you about how you are surfacing some of that evidence through story. Fantastic points. And, you know, one of the eight forms of evidence that we really zoom in on is that behavioral and implementation research, um, it, because we see it being absolutely critical, because as you say, Michael, behavior change underpins so much of what has to change. And, and I think we have a lot of lessons to learn about storytelling. We we think it's critical to be able to tell stories about a compelling problem of viable policy and that conducive politics because you need all three of them if you're going to spur change at the political level. But we would love to learn from others who are many steps ahead of us in the storytelling business because that is essential for driving change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, Maria Elena and Michael and congratulations, John, for a brilliant presentation. And now we are going to our next speaker, Gianluca Bregi. Uh, welcome. Gianluca is the director of the Aquiles Clavo Foundation, which aims to develop vaccines for uh, forgotten uh, diseases and make them available in low and, in, low and middle income countries at uh, reasonable prices. And his presentation is going to tell us a bit about that, about developing and making vaccines ac accessible. You. Let's see first this first technical hurdle here. So here we have both the pointer and the okay, the remote control. Okay, uh, thank you to the organizers and to, to give us the opportunity to be here today and to present the work that we have done. Um, haven't touched anything. Okay, we should be there. So our, my talk today will be on targeted partnerships that we have implemented to accelerate availability of vaccines against neglected diseases of poverty. So uh, this is really our, our main challenge that we have uh, faced, but not the only one. 
as you guys know, um, low-income countries are still plagued today by infectious diseases. Sub-Saharan Africa, in particular, is an area with still the highest mortality rate in the world. Uh, if you notice uh, the, um, the graph over here, the number of deaths has really not been decreasing in Sub-Saharan Africa in the last 10 years, and therefore the percentage of under five children dying in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa versus the rest of the world has been increasing substantially in the, uh, in the last years. Um, there are few incentives to develop vaccines with little uh, economic return, like the ones that we used uh, in uh, uh, developing countries. Uh, and the diseases remain neglected because there is a market failure, essentially, in, uh, in developing these tools. Uh, but today, technology is available to develop this vaccine in a sustainable way. Uh, and we were lucky enough to find the technology that could be uh, scaled up. But structured collaboration to mobilize funds are needed. Um, the target, disease target that we have been, that we chose because we have been trying to get hold of a, a way of fighting this disease for over 10 years is invasive non typhoidal salmonellosis. It's most common invasive bacterial infection in Africa. It's endemic in Sub-Saharan Africa, claiming over 75,000 lives a year, mainly children under five, uh, with a very high mortality rate, uh, from 15% up to 25%. This is because uh, it often is associated with HIV and malaria, and it's difficult to diagnose so since it's difficult to diagnose, it's also treated with an appropriate uh, um, antibacterial um, drug, and therefore it has been developed, uh, has developed antimicrobial resistance. No vaccines are available. Here you can see the countries that are uh, mostly affected, and this is part, has come out of part of our research, that are mostly affected by this, uh, by this disease. So, um, how did we go about uh, uh, financing these vaccines? So we started, as I said, in 2012, and the first question, and the first answer was like, you know, what is INTS? But we did manage over the year to put together collaborations that are collective impact collaborations. That is, every partner brings what it can bring to the to the to the to the effort without having uh, necessarily to do all of the work. And so here. We have uh, uh, the, a not-for-profit organiza organization, which is the, the Sclavo, leading scientifically and doing the fundraising. We had academic partners to increase disease and scientific knowledge, and industry partners to effectively and timely develop a vaccine. So we started from uh, uh, local funding uh, in, uh, in Tuscany, in Italy, because actually the technology was developed in Italy, so in Tuscany. So through local funds, we managed to scale up this technology. Uh, since the technology is very promising for uh, um, producing uh, low-cost vaccines, we then applied to the European uh, Commission. We got a second large uh, uh, pro European project, uh, H2020. And from the EDCTP that still uses EU funds, we got a second grant in 2021 that also uh, allowed us to bring the product from uh, uh, preclinical studies, which was here, to phase one, to phase two. So, um, what is the most innovative aspect about this, in this solution? I, we believe that the not-for-profit entity, being the fundraiser, but mostly the scientific leader, has been important, because you had to deal with two different realities, academia on one side and industry on the other. And both of them individually may not be able, have the time, be allowed, or have the capacity to develop these vaccines. But you need to take from them what is necessary and let them have something while you, they're helping with this so that the project can continue and go on. Um, 
the results of this strategy were, uh, are clearly shown by data that come from the Independent Policy Cure Research Institute. So the, uh, in Europe, the average investment on uh, vaccines against, this uh, vaccine against INTS went from uh, about half a million. And with the start of the other project, it increased tenfold. So this is very clearly as we introduced the vaccine, the, the, we started the projects, the um, funding really came in and it still, we'll still be going uh, for, for another uh, three years over there. So we think we're gonna have something really good at the end of this. Um, what we had to face, we had two challenges. So the first challenge was to advance a vaccine that had been neglected until then. And this was obtained uh, with two major EU uh, funds, uh, projects, that brought 12.6 million euros. And we have two very good partnerships with leading uh, institutions, mainly academia, but also industrial from four continents. And second, we had to increase the knowledge of ANTS because this was really something that was missing. People did not appreciate, did not have the knowledge that ANTS had that kind of impact on, uh, on especially on children in the, low, in the poorest area of the world. So that's something that has been really sort of left on the side. And I'm glad that through all of the work that we have done in seroepidemiology, epidemiology, disease models, we managed to uh, participate to WHO's um, expert meetings that we had in 2021 and 22, and now we are still contributing to WHO full value vaccination assessment, uh, and we really hope to take help take this vaccine to the, uh, to the people who need it as soon as possible. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gianluca. Brilliant presentation, important work. And now, uh, please, I know Maria Elena wanted to uh, start with this round of feedback. So, Maria Elena, just go ahead. Yes, thank you. Salve Gianluca, saluti da Houston. Uh, oh, thanks, well. everybody. Uh, this presentation is uh, very uh, close and dear to me, uh, being also um, a vaccine developer for neglected tropical diseases. So, I want to commend uh, the Sclavo Foundation and the partnership, the product development partnership approach that they use, which is, of course, something that many of us have been advocating for at least a couple of decades. And so it's amazing to see how we have many um, groups that have been slowly moving along, maybe at the pace of the turtle, but still moving the turtle. Uh, to move from the basic discoveries from, you know, academia, research laboratories, to seeing things really translating into clinical, um, uh, uh, testable interventions, um, and ideally, of course, moving them towards the last mile, which would be to finally see them uh, not only uh, licensed and uh, deployed, uh, scalable, produced, but also, of course, uh, delivered and accessible to the populations in need. So thank you for for the presentation. I think you may you you raise uh, various very important um, points. So I'm going to start uh, first uh, with leveraging that academic creativity to try and to shift the paradigm that you know in you know discoveries from the academic um, settings are important and more and more. We are adapting uh, our knowledge, our, that creativity to um, become more business uh, adapt, uh, uh, talking about you know, the value propositions of how do you move through the valleys of death, right? You know, from R&D to clinical trials, and then ideally clinical trials to deployment. So that is very important learning also how to do the regulatory sciences um, so that we can meet the quality and the rigorness of the um, designs of the safety trials and certainly efficacy trials. But I think what you raised is uh, this uh, concept of very uh, trusted and sustainable partnerships, including the funders' uh, uh, partners, 
um, the leveraging the resources to try to really bring, like you said, you know, everybody brings to the table as much as they can, what they can, their capabilities, but uh, incorporating also uh, the concept of decolonizing and really um, um, uh, translating also the empowerment of some of these solutions being um, reversely innovate, innovated uh, it, within the countries that they need. And, and you showed clearly an example using the consortium in Africa, you know, in our work, for example, and I have to say, because we are speaking to Brazilian audience, you know, we have um, uh, our hookworm vaccine initiative and our schistosomiasis vaccine initiative, similar to the Sclavo initiative, have relied on um, academia and corporations, organizations in Brazil like Biomanguinhos and Butantan, and we are replicating that model. Um, so I will end with the fact that it can be done. I think the challenge um, that you, we all have and you all have is that, again, last mile, um, what happens after you reach the phase one, phase two stage, which would require heavy involvement by the developing country vaccine manufacturing networks so that they can be producing the vaccine locally, indigenously with innovation that can be um, considered um, local and, and empower the local producers. Um, you mentioned very clearly the engagement of the society and the community because they need to demand and they need to be the ones receiving such interventions. So we still have a long ways to go, especially in sustaining the financial model and coming up with innovative financial model. But um, again, I congratulate you and I wish you and uh, as us to try to push more um, the agenda, especially the, the United Nations and the um, Global Goal Agenda, so that uh, NTDs and um, neglected diseases of poverty um, really can uh, um, sustain and, and survive. Um, and hopefully we can, we can see many of these interventions reach the people in need. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. I don't know, um, you have any comment, Gianluca, that you want to... Yes. Uh, couple of questions here. I think the technology was what really helped start this process. So uh, there was this technology that is uh, is called Gemma. So general uh, modules uh, are outer membrane vesicles that are hyper-producing uh, antigens. I'm not saying anything secret. It's public. It's published. And has very, very high yields. So uh, it was a technology that was fit for a product for developing countries because the cost of goods there will be very, very low. This is what interested uh, the local funder, the Regione Toscana, also because they said, this is a local technology, we want to develop this technology locally, and we did. And uh, the evidence that came from that first uh, financing was crucial for having the, Europe the first European um, grant that appreciated this even more because at that point the development, the technological development had gone on and so at that point to get the financing for phase, for the second for phase two essentially was as simple. Uh, what is somehow to me reassuring is that at the same time WHO started with the full value of vaccination assessment which is the beginning of the recommendation for a vaccine. Uh, hopefully we'll go into the Gavi strategic plan uh, together with other vaccines. There are many vaccines that are needed. Uh, this is one of them. We have to see how it goes. But once get through that, that analysis that's done uh, very, in a very meticulous way by WHO, hopefully to get the financing also to finish the trials will be important. Uh, production, uh, we have also collaborated in the past on, the, on a typhoid vaccine that has been now produced in India because that's a, a disease that is more uh, common in the, in the Asian continent. Hopefully this is something that may be brought forward in Africa, we hope. It's not in our hands, but you know, this is a disease that is clearly Sub-Saharan Africa 
and somehow northern and southern Africa. So I, I would really hope that somehow production, at least part of the production, is done over there. Thank you, Gianluca. Uh, we don't have much time, so I would ask Susan and Michael to just give their feedback very quickly in a couple of minutes, please. Yeah, well, I'll do that. And thank you very much, Maria Elena, uh, for your clearly experts speaking to experts. <laughs> uh, Gianluca, congratulations um, to, to your initiative and also to your success. I mean, the value of a vaccine really lies in the fact that it prevents a disease before it starts and comes with all the consequences on societies, individuals and economies. And what that can mean, we just all painfully experienced. Um, but with COVID, um, it was of such a scale that in almost no time, there was a number of vaccines available. And, uh, and neglected disease really means that um, because there is hardly any market and hardly any economic incentive, diseases are neglected and the vaccine development is neglected. And that is really a sad state of affairs. And this really adds value to your to your initiative and which I truly believe is transformative. It's a different approach than the traditional R&D um, approach of, of the pharmaceutical industry. And I really commend you to, to that. Concerning the last mile, that was also my point. Um, we work together with Africa CDC, with the African Union. They have great plans to increase manufacturing capacities on the continent because they have hardly any <clears throat> capacities to produce vaccines for African people. So in Senegal, South Africa, it's on the, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, to be set up. Um, I'm happy to be in contact with you uh, bilaterally if, if there are contacts which can be of any help. But yes, of course, the production issue is important and the distribution issue as well. And the new Africa CDC has a keen interest in producing vaccines on the continent for their people. So perhaps I can support you with contacts. Thank you very much and congratulations. Over to Michael. Thank yeah, you. quick add, Gianluca, congratulations on this work. I want us to look very briefly at the social science component of this. Maria Elena already talked about this, how to build trusted partnerships, the how here. And Gianluca, you've already mentioned some of it, some component of it. When I teach sustainable development at NYU every year, I encourage my students to look at how do we build political will, private sector will, and public will for this work. We generally know what the problems are, we know what the solutions are. How do we build the will for this work? And Gianluca, you mentioned something here briefly about local local, 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 and I'm inferring, I'm interpreting what that local meant and the weight of that local in terms of pride, identity, leadership, that that helped in building some of those trusted partnerships and some of that political will and private sector will, but I'd be keen to hear more in terms of the how, how we move people together in a trusted way, in a partnershiping way to get this work done. And that's some of what I'm thinking through here in this particular approach. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, look, unfortunately, we don't have much time. So if you could, like, answer very, very quickly. You will remain with this doubt, I'm afraid. <laughs> Just very, very quickly. You have 30 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds. So uh, it was important to start there. You know, I, we started higher, and uh, we were told, if, you know, if somebody in your country, in your area, doesn't trust you and funds you, don't come to us to ask for money. So <laughs> it was also a way of starting, say, okay, let's look locally first for funds. Uh, but the key was, this is local technology, will be developed here uh, with people from this area, and we'll have the, the industrial development of this area. And this is really what was approached. The project arri arrived forward on, a, you know, on 120 projects exactly because it was an innovative project with innovative technology carried out in Tuscany with Tuscan technology. Thank you, Gianluca. I, it's a pity that we don't have much time for more discussion over these very interesting topics, but we need to move to the next speaker. Just round of applause for Gianluca, please. <laughs> now, we are moving on to our next speaker, Ali Ruiz Coronel. She is an anthropologist and a researcher at the Institute for Social Sciences at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, and she's going to tell us about the Open Door Initiative, Open Door Clinic Initiative. Well, 
First of all, I want to thank you for the invitation. It has been an amazing experience being here, and I also love Rio, so it's nice to be here again. And I'm really lucky to be talking about, uh, about this after Dr. Gianluca, because I think I could start with a question, uh, like once we have the vaccines, how can we guarantee that all people have access to these vaccines? And in my country, where I come from, it's a very inequity society, so people were not getting the vaccines, and we had a uh, very sad experience during the COVID-19 pandemic because the vaccine was available, but not for them. So um, just, I mean, obviously you know, and you can imagine that homelessness and health are very closely related and that homeless people usually had very bad health. But I am just showing you this data to show uh, how bad it is. You know? um, so these are data from the National Council for homelessness, and they say that people who are homeless have higher rates of illness and die on average 12 years sooner than the general population. And street children, they, uh, they die within the first four years of their street life. In other words, a child who ends up in the street at age eight has 50% chance of dying before the age of 12. So this is how bad the situation for them is. And beyond this, we still had something worse, which was COVID. So um, the homeless people in Mexico City didn't even know or had information about what COVID was or what they could do. So we were really worried that having already this bad health, they would still be like infected and die. So we decided to do the opposite. We, uh, instead of unlocking ourselves in our houses like everyone did, I'm a university professor, so I uh, conveyed my students to volunteer. It was against the rules of the university, but still I think that Education has not only to do with the knowledge, the scientific knowledge, but also with empathy and with um, the responsibility that you have as a medical doctor with uh, patients. So we uh, opened the clinic outside in the streets. We provided information about what COVID is and how people uh, could get treatment and, uh, yeah, and have some follow-up and all that. And after COVID, we decided that um, it was a very good idea it is uh, a small thing. It is very uh, community-based, uh, local, but it was everything that people had. So it was, it's a small thing, it's a very little thing, but at the same time, it's the only thing available. So what we do is, uh, before all the, the persons who are members of this uh, clinic are volunteers, and we all belong to the National Autonomous University of Mexico, the School of Medicine, and also Anthropology. I teach uh, medical anthropology. And um, then we obviously have some um, training for them and we listen to the expert NGOs. So they tell us where to place the clinic, when, what are the dynamics of the uh, street people, so w which is the right moment to doing it. And we also do field work to invite people and tell them that everything is going to be free and that we're going to treat them very well with respect and dignity. And then uh, during the clinic, we provide healthcare information, which is very challenging because most of people are illiterate. So it's difficult to uh, make medical students who have like uh, middle class, upper class uh, communication with, with homeless people. So that itself is a challenge. But um, we managed to do it and we well, provided vaccines, the test of COVID, and now we do more uh, things. We have like a very primary um, medical consultation. And he, we, are also, uh, we are also getting uh, data from an invisible population. In Mexico, we don't even know how many they are, what are their illnesses, how they relate to homelessness. We always think that they are only uh, drug consumers, but for example, they don't sleep at all. They cannot sleep eight hours like we all do. So the, the, we have like very specific projects on health like that, for example, what is the impact of not being able to sleep eight hours on a chronic uh, basis? We also are doing some studies of microbiome and well, some more interesting things. <laughs> and um, I think um, the, the, the second thing is if someone needs something, we also accompany them, but accompany means really going to the street, look for the person, go all the way to the clinic and talk to the medical doctors who are supposed to treat them. So um, I think that um, this solution tackles two problems. First, well, the lack of access to healthcare for homeless people. 
but also uh, a lack of education for the uh, medical professionals on empathy. And I think uh, that's one of our uh, important things here. Thank you, thank you, Ali. Uh, keep the microphone because we are going for the feedback. Uh, so, Susan, do you want to start? Uh, yes, sure. Thank you very much, um, Professor Cornell, for your presentation. Um, uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, the value of this uh, approach I, I really see, and first of all, you, you help uh, people in their day-to-day -day struggle, but you also collect information which are highly relevant um, to change the underlying frame conditions um, and to improve access um, to health services for those people, not only in Mexico City, obviously, um, but around the world we have the same problems. If there was time, I was about to ask you what would be your main recommendations looking at maybe initial results to your government to change the situation for this part of our society. But I'll hand over to um, Maria Elena and if there's time, um, I'm keen to hear you. Uh, I'm actually going to send it to Michael because I think this is very relevant to your work and then I'll maybe if there's time I comment. Yeah, I'll just weigh in here on the social science component. I love that you are taking it to the people, the open door clinic, the movable tent, being in the streets, making it as easy as possible to gain access to this support and this healthcare. So bravo to take it to the people. In so much of our work, we don't often take it to the people. We expect the people to come to us. So thank you for taking it to the people. I wanna also draw out some things that I really appreciated. You talked about against the rules of the university and that you were leading in this way. Way to walk the talk, way to lead for your students. What an experience for them to see you lead in this way, even if it was against the rules of the university. So way to, way to lead, way to walk the talk there. Two other things, I appreciate the before, during, and after. There seemed to be a real commitment to sustained care and sustaining that behavior change, both in terms of the services you're providing and the response that you're hoping to get from the people you're working with and for. So much of our work is often one-off and not this kind of sustained thinking around whole ecosystems so that we're really on-ramping people to better lives rather than just a one-off. So I love the sustained care. And then lastly, you said it and then you finished your presentation, but thinking about empathy, wow. Yes to more empathy. I'd be very keen to hear how you're creating a culture and cultivating that empathy across your colleagues and in industry and the university. A lot of necessary work there too, but thank you for the work you're doing here. Well, thank you all. Maybe I can just uh, close up with just again the congratulations. Very pleased to see that also you're doing this in Mexico. Of course, I'm from Honduras originally, so all the Mesoamerican region for me is very also important. And I wonder indeed how much the culture, like, you know, the concept of, you know, the, the anthropology of who we are, right, where we come from and in, in our, in our history and our roots also contribute to the success of these types of projects. Uh, because we, you know, of of the, of of like you said, like you know, where we come from, right, and our background, and how we as people also want to contribute to society, and 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 Mexico has some very interesting health uh, uh, systems and programs, and I wonder if that also contributes to the success to showcase that it can be done. So congratulations. I'm really not sure if those were questions, so that's why I didn't uh, answer much. Um, uh, thank you for your comments. Um, look, um, I, I don't think that, that uh, the problem in Mexico is that homeless people are not uh, part of, of the policies. So um, we thought that, um, yeah, it's, it's like, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, something that was always there just became more visible. So um, even if in our culture, if it is like uh, part of it to take care of others, I don't think the homeless are part of, of our main concerns. So I don't know if that answers what. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. Very important work what you're doing with people facing homelessness in Mexico. 
Um, I want to go to our next speaker, but before that, I just want to say that I'm very sorry that we don't have much time. This is all very interesting. I would like to have hours to talk to you and our STEAM Solutions Committee, but unfortunately, we are on a tight schedule, so we only have four minutes maximum for our speakers and then 10 minutes maximum for the conversation with the committee. But um, now we are going to welcome Ibrahim Acampo. He is the network manager of SDS Sensa Health and he is going to tell us about the Maybox initiative. The floor is yours. Thank you, Clara, for this introduction. So, uh, good morning and or good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm here to talk about, to talk to you about an exciting project that our network is working on. It is a digital health project that aims to revolutionize the way that we keep uh, people healthy and informed in the rural area in the Sahel region. The Sahel region, the Sahel is a region whose health indicators are some of the lowest in the world. Can you imagine that for 100,000 live births, an average of 600 women and girls lose their life, and for 1,000 live births, around 28 neonatal infants died due to the limited access to healthcare. It is therefore urgent to profoundly improve the healthcare access for those populations. To do this, we need to address such issues as health, education, and st standard of living, as they are all interconnected and need to be improved in order to improve the uh, quality life of individuals and uh, societies. This is where our project come in. We are creating a medical, agricultural, and educational digital solution called MyBox, which will use the multidimensional priority index MPI as a level of, to strengthen the public health system in local community and their ecosystem. MyBox is a total vocal digital solution in local African languages accessible on different terminals like TV, ca cabin, and um, mobile phone with or without internet connectivity. It will help population with low literacy, income, and internet access in strengthening public health system to an integrated and interactive approach of health, education, and agriculture. As I say, this, uh, this innovative aspect is uh, accessible for uh, the po local population to uh, terminal like TV, mobile application, and uh, cabin cabins. This approach will provide a concrete impact in the rural area, a better understanding and ownership of sustainable development by the rural communities with the support of qualified experts. The project will, fa will fa uh, facilitate access to health, education, and agricultural services through three adaptive digital tools, Medibox, which will provide access to health information and awareness, training content, and connection to health professionals. Agribox already on its experimental stage, which provide access to training and market information as well as connect farmers to buyers and trainers. And Edubox, which will provide access to literacy content and peer-to-peer -peer learning. The design of the platform content is based on the need 
of the population collected by the server, those modifiable over time to a bottom-up information system. This large-scale data collection and pro processing platform will provide trends and anonymized data that will facilitate the scaling up process and export the MyBox approach. This project will be a game changer, not only in the field of public health, but also in the field of unemployment, gender, and social and social inequality and inequity. We believe that everyone deserves to and should have access to a better resources and information they need to take control over their well-being. We are committed to make it this a reality to leave no one behind. Thank you. Thank you, Rahima. Um, our solutions committee is ready for feedback. Please, Susan, Maria Elena, Michael. Let me start. Um, well, congratulations, Dr. Campo, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and you are absolutely right with your solution and your approach because access to health information to health starts actually with access to information which is evidence based and which is trusted. And this is for most of us around the world, a very normal, easy day to day business and matter, but for millions of others, it's actually not. And, and so this is a, a true great initiative you are, you are taking here and your solution goes the last mile. So you are providing firsthand information, evidence-based trusted to millions of people. And this may be a game changer for those people indeed with regards to, to health. Linking this information with consultation of specialists with this possibility adds really significant value uh, in my view and indeed uh, provides, especially in remote settings or fragile settings, um, a huge uh, improvement with regards to access to, to health. What I particularly also appreciate about your initiative is that you promote the use of local therapeutic, therapeutic plants. They are really often effective uh, remedies they are affordable and they are locally available. But the impact of promoting them is much greater in my views. Um, you keep also valuable traditional knowledge about health alive for generations to come. And in using those local resources, you also contribute to better health of our planet. And you may even trigger small scale market developments and income opportunities in doing so. So overall, congratulations uh, with this approach and, um, and I'm sure it's a transformative um, uh, initiative. Thanks. Over to uh, Maria Elena. Yes, sure. Uh, again, congratulations. This, I mean, I have to say all of the teams have been amazing, but this, this project is also very important because um, not only you used the power of uh, digital, <laughs> but uh, um, very uh, comprehensive, not only by focusing on, of course, health with the Medibox, but also touch the interface between human health and certainly also, uh, you know, um, I guess our, our, our planet health with the Agribox and then put in context with how you're also uh, providing literacy. Um, uh, the comment uh, that Suzanne made with regards a little bit about, you know, um, the informal markets of advancing local, I guess, um, medical solutions, you know, maybe my, my comment is um, it's always hard to ensure that it also meets all the regulatory and the quality standards. So you, you of course, don't want to give the perception that these um, solutions go outside of the of, of you know of, of the strict safety um, and assurance uh, guidelines that you know certainly you know you have to to ensure that are there we you know with the regulators and so maybe my question is how much is how you involve in these platforms the, the government and agencies that really support the um, assurance of, you know, that the information, of course, is uh, um, not only truthful, but at the same time meets all the, um, the assurance and quality uh, considerations. Thank you. Ibrahim, I'll just add a couple of things, and perhaps this will be no surprise for the audience in the room. 
from a social science perspective or a behavior change perspective, but I work for an organization named the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, of which Rio is a member, and we're speaking to a crowd that is part of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and my affiliate employer is the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, and we deal a lot with carbon neutrality and deep decarbonization and retrofit accelerators, all to say that we need to let go of that and use language that most people are using. And I love how you package this. I love it's a my box. I love it's a meta box and an agri box and an edu box. And it's got a mobile application. Love, love, love how you package this in ways that are digestible, easily to access by anyone in terms of concepts. So bravo, because that is, that is so necessary in all of our sustainability work. And I just, it became obvious to me how you packaged it and I love how you packaged it. So thanks Ibrahima, great work. Thank you. Yeah, um, for the regulatory uh, part, um, we know we have already Agribox, uh, which is on its experimental uh, stage. So um, we are working on it. So to, to, to find a way to how make it possible, as soon, po um, as soon possible to, to have all the regularly to re rules and uh, to to make a first pilot phases of uh, the agribox first thank you thank, you. thank, thank you, you so much congratulations for a brilliant presentation Well, now you can welcome our last speaker, Darel van Groenen. She is a distinguished professor at the Nelson Mandela University, and she will tell us about an initiative to improve teachers' health. Thank you, Darel. Thank you very much, uh, Mulvaney Nonke. As said, I'm from Nelson Mandela University in South Africa, the university that sets out to change the world um, through being in service of society. So it is my pleasure today to present to you one of the solutions that is part of a suite of health, digital health solutions um, in community health services, literally where we cover from cradle to grave. So the focus of today is how do you guide teachers and ordinary citizens to make healthier lifestyle choices and decrease health risks? So the aim is to take this and put the self-management of behavior change in the hands of the people. So how do we manage our own health and our own lifestyles? So in order to do that, we created some smart solutions um, this was co-created with our beneficiaries and the five steps that you see here are part of what they thought would work for them. I have to say that this is a, a project that brings together all the different disciplines. Um, ICT is just the glue that brings together the different um, social sciences and health sciences. So we created a mobile app that integrates lifestyle interventions, physical activity, healthy eating, stress, sleep management. Those are everyday topics that we can all identify with and that we all need help with. So part of the five steps were then derived in collaboration with the beneficiaries. So how does this work? It's based on a traffic light system. So the aim was to create an opportunity for any person in any space to take this app on their mobile phone and go into a very basic healthcare facility. Keeping in mind in Africa, often we are very far removed from healthcare facilities. So if you can get to someone that can take your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your blood glucose and BMI, if you enter your height and weight, it automatically calculates your BMI, it generates a risk profile for you. And this then helps you to set your own personal goals as to how you wish to achieve these. And through this, you can self-monitor and actually act on this. This particular project was done for teachers, but of course, as you can see from this, it's relevant to any person in society. So how do we 
onboard people? How do we get them to do this? So part of what we've included in the solutions are all these nice information sheets, the um, interactive videos. We've included um, some gamification elements. There's digital storytelling. I know there was talk about digital storytelling earlier today. And then obviously it focuses on the topics that impacts each and every one of us. So when you think about, uh, we, we spoke yesterday about um, the time before COVID and the time post COVID. If you look at the, the topics on the screen there, they're very relevant in a post COVID society. So how do we do that to touch the lives of every single person that we interact with? We put a tool in their hand and say, you become part of the behavior change that you want to see in your life. Finally, to ensure that we have um, continuity and sustainability, we're working with the different ministries of health and education. We've introduced some short learning programs with professional development components as well. And this then obviously onboards people to also participate in this initiative. So with this, I want to say this is the key to managing your own life and to bring about behavioral change in your life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darrell. <laughs> Susan, Marilena, Michael, comments? Of course. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Grunen, and uh, congratulations um, for, for your initiative. Kasi held. Um, what I liked a lot about this was that you're actually addressing the leading cause of death globally with 32% cardiovascular diseases are the cause of death and uh, it's on the, on the rise. And it's all preventable by a healthy lifestyle and with your elements of the um, app you actually address all of them, almost all of them. Um, and uh, what I also liked was that you have chosen teachers as a target group. Um, I'm not sure how you, you came about it, but uh, teachers are one part of an increasingly inactive society, that's true, but teachers teach our generations to come. And, um, and it's absolutely important that they start with their behavior change and then they transmit this hopefully effectively, um, effectively uh, to, to the next generations to come. And this will truly change and transform millions of lives, but it will hopefully also have a significant impact on the reduction of uh, um, the cause of death of cardiovascular diseases uh, prevalence in, um, on the globe. Um, again, the first step to, to a healthier lifestyle is um, access to information and uh, using a digital application. Um, I appreciate that you have always the possibility to continuously add new information which reaches out. Um, and here is a question or maybe only a comment because of the time limit. Um, I would wish in future, if you could possibly, um, if not yet done, also add information um, about the interlinkages of our health and healthy lifestyle, healthy diet, physical exercise, etc., with the health of our environment, of our animals around us, plants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's pretty much linked to a healthy diet and how this contributes actually to planetary health. And if this is being taught to the next generation, this has even a greater impact. Thank you so much and congratulations. Um, I appreciate it um, to be part of it and listen to your presentation. And I hand over to Maria Elena. Thank you, Suzanne. And again, uh, congratulations. I think the digital world and using these types of um, tools, uh, it's, I mean, certainly the new generation has adopted these more than maybe all, all, all of us older generation, but we're learning, right? And so I think, maybe a comment slash question or, or consideration is there are so many now of these tools you know rings and fitbits and you know other things that you know maybe they can be integrated you know some of them of course are more accessible in the lmic settings some may be less some may need a little bit more like like suzanne said you know the education 
So just a consideration of how um, in the world of eventually having a lot of competition in this field, how, how you can maintain a true to the intent and certainly contribute um, to, uh, to giving tools that then can be managed by the individual, right, or by the community um, um, as per their needs based on their settings and their, um, their location. So congratulations, this is uh, amazing work. Yeah, I'll just quickly add in the social science space, as we think about behavior change, the sustainability field has a lot to learn from the health field. And this is a great example of all that the sustainability world can learn from. In the climate space, our cities at the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance have for years produced 100 page reports detailing their climate action plans and they put them on their website. That was years ago and they've since realized that few people are reading those 100 page reports and they've moved towards gamification. They've moved towards mobile apps for sustainable lifestyles, etc. They've moved towards visuals and videos. That is the direction we need to go. And what I love about what you've done here, Professor von Grunen, is that it's very visual. It's bite sized because people can get overwhelmed with what they need to do, whether it be health for their body or sustainability and health for the planet. And that overwhelm often creates inaction. And so how do we give people, how do we offer up visually and with video, these bite-sized accessible approaches so that people can start to change their behavior, see how life is better and continue doing it. So I really like how you put in, in both the brochure and what I'm sure is the app and the, the gamification, really bite-sized efforts here. How do we on-ramp behavior that gets people away from procrastination, away from status quo bias, that gets them doing things so they don't feel overwhelmed by the choice here. So again, bravo, and just encouraging everyone here in this conversation to think about how we can do better in visualizing the solutions, in providing bite-sized on ramps for people because that is that is the answer. That's where we need to move. So thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Maybe if I could just comment briefly, um, just to say that the target audience that we started with were teachers, with the aim of them influencing both society but also then the younger generations. And because of time, I could not show that, but there are specific targeted interactions for children as well at different age groups and then currently we are working at expanding into the general society beyond teachers. Teachers have often a very sedentary lifestyle within the African context but high levels of stress, uh, poor nutrition etc. So that's how they were identified as the initial target audience and I have to say this is research that has gone on over a period of 10 years and uh, culminated in all of this. Health environment, obviously, yes, that is the next part that we will be adding. Very, very important and um, very relevant to our continent at this point in time. The beauty of the app that we have, and that relates to the Fitbits and all the other solutions that are out there. We're not reinventing the wheel. We know that there are millions of apps out there. So what we tried to do was to create modular approach and bring the best of the best into this. So we did not go and write new fitness apps and things like that. That would be silly. Based on the multidisciplinary research team that we have, they selected the best for mental wellness and said, look, the following five solutions would really support the cause. So what this app does is it's modular and it takes you out to existing very good solutions that other people have already developed. And then it allows you to interact and record all in one space where you can then interact with your targets that you wish to set. So bringing in other components like environmental health, etc., becomes a very easy thing to do. So the way in which the app was developed caters for all of that. And thank you very much for all your kind words. It's really appreciated. Thank you very much for the Solutions Committee panels for joining us, taking the time from their busy schedules, and for contributing uh, such valuable feedback, inputs, and commentary that I'm very sure that today's presenters will carry on the discussion with them bilaterally. Again, we would also like to thank our moderator for today for her support and contributions, Clara Marin from IS Global. 
And as we bring this year's Global Solutions Forum to a close, SDSN would like to express its gratitude to the organizers, uh, our partners GIZ, Vito, GSTIC, and of course FIO Cruz for partnering with us to bring this edition of GSF 2023 to life. Please visit the forum's website, it's globalsolutionsforum.org and its related social media channels uh, for all the information of today's solutions and also those from previous editions. Also, today's recording will be available on SDSN's YouTube channel. Many thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you at the next edition. Thank you all.